You see, you and I, we look at the Father above the clouds, the sun transfigured, the glory of the mountaintop, even the splendor of heaven, which is glimpsed in some way. And then we look upon a world of suffering and we say, does God know? And we say, does God care? And we say, does God intervene? Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, and uh, Jonathan, you just identified some pretty big questions, probably questions that all of us have had to wrestle through at some point in time. Various circumstances that may bring about those questions, but I think we're all going to have to wrestle through those at some point. For the person listening today who's right in the middle of that, how do you begin to answer that? I think looking on the suffering of this world and asking the question, does God understand Does God care? Has God done anything? Will God do anything? As we wrestle with those questions, and it is a matter of wrestling, by the way, we don't get quick and easy answers to those things. Those are big and deep questions. But as we wrestle with them, we have to look to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven above in accordance with the will of the Father himself, that he might suffer in our place. And understanding that the God of heaven sent his son to suffer and die for our salvation and to address the reality of of suffering in this world that is a result of sin, of course, seeing that, it at least softens our heart uh, to the God of heaven to recognize that he is a God of profound love and compassion. And, And I think that opens the door for us to listen to the message of Jesus Christ and to get to know him better. And I trust that each one listening will be willing to do that today. Well, let's do that together. If you have a Bible handy, join us in Matthew chapter 17, looking at verses 14 to 27, as we begin a message called, The Son of Humble Authority. Here is Jonathan. With one of our kids at home, I've been watching over recent days a little documentary on TV all about the White House, uh, how it functions, what kind of responsibilities the staff carry there, what goes on within that famed building. And you may know that one of the most impressive feats that the staff of the White House ever accomplished is the feat of the transition from one family to another family on Inauguration Day. One family leaves, the house is packed up, and by the time the next family arrives, the house is unpacked and set up for them according to their personal tastes and wishes. And I think there is for the staff on that day a huge sense of anticipation as the new family travels down Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol. When this new family arrives, what, what will it be like? What will it be like to work for this new president? When he, when he enters his newly decorated and arranged Oval Office and sits down at that famous Resolute desk, what will be his first great act of power? What will he do? What will it be like to work under his authority? Together in Matthew 17, we have just seen Jesus in his glory, commended by none other than Moses and Elijah, Affirmed by the Father above, we have heard the instruction from the cloud, listen to him. If we ever thought that Jesus was merely a carpenter, merely a traveling teacher on a dusty road, we have now been set straight in our thinking by the transfiguration. We now know he is the son of the Father. He is the prince of heaven. He is the king of glory. Now, of course, this isn't crowning day, as it were. The transfiguration is a powerful foretaste of what is yet to come. It is is a preview, but it is a great and dramatic declaration of the power and identity of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus now comes down the Mount of Transfiguration, the question in the air is, what will he do? Now that his glory has been revealed in this very dramatic fashion, now that his identity has been made unmistakably clear, now that his authority has been irrefutably confirmed, how will he exercise that authority? To what use will he put it? We don't need to wait very long, actually, to see the answer. Jesus gets straight back to the work of ministry when he returns from the height. And here here is what we see. Here is what we observe. We see that the Son exercises his authority by first showing mercy to the suffering. 
He shows mercy to the suffering. Jesus and the disciples who were with him on the mountain come upon a crowd of people gathered, it seems, with the other disciples who stayed below. Remember, only a small group went up. And the first person they encounter is a man, a father in a state of some desperation concerning the suffering of his son. It's there in verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, kneeling before him, said, Lord, have mercy on my son. Now in this moment, as the mountaintop experience comes to a swift end, and Jesus and his disciples return to earthly reality with something of a thud, they encounter a situation that actually encapsulates the worst of the wreckage of the fall. A situation that encapsulates the very heart of the human tragedy. Here is a child. Here's a child whose life has been blighted by a terrible ailment. We learn later that he is oppressed by a demon. This precious child of a human father suffers terribly, his dad says. And we believe it. We learn a little more. He falls into the fire. Presumably the the fire in the home that is there for some heat and for cooking He's fallen in, not just once or twice, which would be awful, unspeakable, a child in the fire. But he falls in, his father says, often. So this boy must be, he he must be scarred. He must be burned. He must be disfigured to some extent. And you know, if you're a parent, you know this. Any injury on a child that leaves any mark, it is heart-wrenching always for parents. Because this child that was born, that arrived into the world so perfect, is being damaged now by this fallen world. Parents know the pain of this. Every parent knows that feeling with every little injury. But regular burns, it's, un- it's unspeakable. It's unthinkable. And then the father says it, it, it gets worse, only worse. The father says that this boy falls into the water. Perhaps there's a well near the home. Perhaps there is a stream nearby. And this happens often as well, says the father. I remember one of our own children as a toddler escaped our grasp and splashed straight into the deep end of a swimming pool before he had any idea how to swim. We got him immediately, and all was well, but it was a terrifying moment. But for that to happen often, that is the stuff of nightmares. As readers, as observers, our heart is broken for the child, so oppressed by the forces of evil, so maimed, so limited by all this, and our heart, of course, goes out to the father. Now, this kind of situation, this kind of story, it is the kind of story that actually gets us asking the question, does God know? Does God know and does God care about all the suffering of this world? I mean, look at this. I mean, what do we do with this kind of situation if we believe in a loving and all-powerful God? Does he just sit in heaven unmoved by all this? What is his response? I think it's absolutely no mistake that this is the very first situation that Jesus encounters when he comes down from the extraordinary time on the mountain. I think there's something quite wonderful within this. Let me try and explain why, see if this resonates with you on any level. Remember again the events of the transfiguration, just briefly. Jesus had been ahead of the transfiguration, preparing his disciples for his death. He had told Peter that he was going to go to Jerusalem to be rejected, to suffer, and to die. It was quite clear that the disciples were not ready for this, did not really understand what was going on. And then then Jesus went up the mountain, and the Father made this great affirmation concerning Jesus. And remember what he said. Remember the love of the Father for his Son that came through so very, very clearly within this verse 5. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, the Father knows as he says those words, he knows that his Son is on his way to suffer and to die. He knows that his Son will be rejected and maligned, and as the Son descends the mount on the long journey to the cross to address the problem of sin that lies at the heart of every problem in this broken and grieving world, the first scene of tragedy that he finds is that of a father grieving the agony of his Son. Is that not a powerful parallel of sorts? It's a partial parallel, not a complete parallel, but it is a very, very powerful movement from one scene on the mountain to the next on the earth below. You see, you and I, we look at the Father above the clouds, 
the sun transfigured, the glory of the mountaintop, even the splendor of heaven, which is glimpsed in some way. And then we look upon a world of suffering and we say, does God know? And we say, does God care? And we say, does God intervene? And what are we seeing here? We are seeing the Father above sending his beloved Son down the mountain back into this world of suffering and grief and of pain. And he is sending his own Son to provide relief and deliverance to the suffering boy, this beloved Son of a human father. But that pit stop at the bottom of the mountain is only that. It's only a pit stop on a greater journey, on the journey to the cross, where the Son of God will suffer and die to release countless sons and daughters of men from the bondage of sin, from the brokenness of a fallen world, from the oppression of the evil one, from the torture of hell. The, the two fathers and the two sons in this drama, they point us, don't they? In their partial parallelism, they point us to the mercy and the kindness of God in sending his son into the world in order that the sons and daughters of men might be released from bondage and might know healing and freedom. It's a very, very beautiful movement in the drama, and it speaks so deeply, doesn't it, to your need and to my need to know that God knows and to know that God cares. It tells us, doesn't it, that God doesn't sit in heaven unmoved, but rather has sent his Son. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and part of the message called The Son of Humble Authority. It's part of a larger series called In the Presence of the King. Now we're going to pause here, but we'll get back to this message in just a moment, so I hope you'll stay with us. Well, if it's been a while since you've been to our website or you've never been there before, I hope you'll come and visit the website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. While you're there, you can uh, check out our weekly e-devotional. You can sign up to subscribe to our newsletter. You'll find links to connect with us on social media and much, much more. One other way to connect with uh, Encounter the Truth and Jonathan's teaching is through our YouTube channel. On YouTube, simply look for Encounter the Truth, like and subscribe, and that way you'll be notified anytime we put new content from Jonathan up there. Next time you're on YouTube, simply look for Encounter the Truth, or when you're at our website, you're going to find links to YouTube and other social media accounts at EncounterTheTruth.org. Another thing available at the website, the opportunity to listen to Jonathan's teaching on demand. You can download or you can stream the daily programs through your computer or mobile device. Come to EncounterTheTruth.org, and that's a great way to stay connected with Jonathan's teaching when you're on the go. Another way, use the Encounter the Truth app. It's really like listening on demand. It's free at your app store. It's a great way to listen to not only this daily radio program, but our weekend broadcast and find other ways to connect with the ministry. So again, find the app at your app store or come to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Let's get back to our message. Again, from Matthew 17, here is Jonathan. It's a very, very beautiful movement in the drama, and it speaks so deeply, doesn't it, to your need and to my need to know that God knows and to know that God cares. It tells us, doesn't it, that God doesn't sit in heaven unmoved, but rather has sent his Son. And his Son wonderfully has mercy and power aplenty to intervene, to help, and to save. The Father, having poured out his heart concerning his Son's affliction, then tells Jesus of the abortive attempts to receive help from the disciples. Verse 16 and he says, and I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. The thought of this child being oppressed by a demon, by a spiritual servant of Satan, for that is what a demon is. It's an awful thought. It's chilling. And we can only imagine how frightening that must have been both for the child and for his family. And of course, to consider the powers of darkness, which are very real in our world today, we mustn't be deceived. To consider those powers, it always sends something of a chill down our spine. But this encounter with Jesus is actually just very, very wonderful. Again, it relates closely to the mountaintop experience. We need to remember the context here and what's been taking place. Ties back to the transfiguration. 
On the mountaintop, we were shown Jesus is the great prince of heaven, the son with the father's authority. He is the true and appointed ruler of the entire universe. That's the symbolism. That is the import of the imagery that we've seen. And now Jesus comes down the mountain. Immediately, he faces an agent of God's great foe, of Satan himself, seeking to destroy this precious child made in the image of God. And how, how does the encounter play out? Well, Jesus rebukes the demon, and it comes out of him. The boy is healed instantly. Now, remember what the father had said of his son. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased, authoritative. Listen to him. The son's voice has authority. That is what the father has declared. Well, notice how Jesus deals with this demon. He speaks a rebuke. The demon listens, and the demon goes. The vision of Jesus in glory we're being shown here, aren't we? It was no dream. It was no illusion. Jesus does possess the Father's authority. He has power over the evil one, and he is going now to the cross to defeat Satan and to undo his wicked work to release men and women and boys and girls from the bondage of sin and from the chains of hell. Now, that's how the Son of Glory uses his power and uses his authority. That's how he chooses to exercise it. You'll notice here that we have a kind of side drama going on with the disciples. You'll have seen that. They have failed to help the boy themselves, and Jesus does have a rebuke for them within this. He lumps them with the faithless and twisted generation, verse 17. When Jesus succeeds in calling out the demon, the disciples sort of ask, you know, what's up? Why did we fail? Verse 19, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I think the section looks a little bit perplexing at first glance. You know, is Jesus saying that we should just be able to name it and claim it? Is that what he's saying here? If we have Faith for anything that we might want, God will just do it for us, no matter how outrageous or outlandish. You know, move a mountain here, make a fortune for me uh, there, pray away all my problems and all my ailments here, there, and everywhere. Nothing will stand in my way. Is that the meaning of these words? Well, no. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. This looks perplexing until we remember and recognize that Jesus is chastising the disciples for not having the faith specifically to do what he has commissioned them to do. When Jesus commissioned the twelve and sent them out on mission, back in chapter 10 of Matthew's gospel, here is what he said to them, Matthew 10 and verse 8. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Those were their marching orders. Jesus commissioned the disciples very specifically to engage in this ministry at this time. And while Jesus was up the mountain, the disciples were meant to be down at the bottom of the mountain, engaging in ministry on his behalf in his strength. But while they were doing that, they were not actually able to do the specific thing he had commissioned them to do. And the problem, he says, is a lack of faith. Faith is the issue. So the call here is not to have faith for anything that we might want, just believe in God is going to do it for you. No, the call is to have faith for the specific things that God has given us by his word to do, the specific acts of obedience that he has called his people to. That is very, very important to see here. And it's important to reckon with their lack of faith within this. Clearly, there is spiritual power available for the casting out of this demon. Clearly, Jesus is strong enough to do it. Clearly, he was able to empower his servants to do this on his behalf. But they don't approach the situation in a posture of faith in Jesus. We can only imagine that they went into it with either two postures. One is a posture of absolute doubt. You know, we look at the situation, it's very, very messy. Obviously, a powerful demon here doing a lot of damage. We're not sure if the Lord is going to come through for this one. Or worse, and this is the alternative, they approached it in a posture actually of self-reliance. Oh, messy situation, we got this one, leave it to us. Either way... They weren't trusting the Lord and his power to do what they'd been instructed to do. And they failed. They fell flat on their faces. 
And I think there's a great lesson here for us within this. The Lord calls us, each one of us, to follow him, to pursue holiness, to make disciples of all nations. He calls us very specifically in recent verses to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. Those are some very, very specific instructions concerning the nature of the Christian life. Some specific calls on our lives if we are to follow Jesus Christ. And we may look upon those things and the challenge of those things and we might feel daunted by them. Holiness, that's too hard for me. Evangelism, far too scary. Self-denial, simply impossible. And we may think to ourselves as we hear the call of Jesus Christ upon our lives, we may think the Lord cannot make this happen in my life. And it's a lack of faith. Or worse, we may look on the challenge of the word of Jesus Christ and think, yeah, holiness, evangelism, self-denial, I've got this. I'll be fine. And if that's our attitude, we are sunk before we've set sail, before we've left the harbor. We are finished before we've begun because the flesh is so weak and we're so self-deceived. Now, again, think context. It is no mistake that this incident takes place right after the mountaintop. These disciples who stayed at the bottom, they need to learn the lesson of the transfiguration. They need to learn that Jesus truly is the Son of the Father above, the one to whom has been given all authority, the powerful one whom they must trust. But while Jesus was at the top of the mountain being shown in his glory, these disciples were at the bottom of the mountain failing to trust his power. How does Jesus exercise his great power and authority when he comes down from the mountain? Well, first, by showing mercy to the suffering. Next, the son, he exercises his authority by submitting himself to the cross. Verse 22, notice it with me. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of man and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Now, it would be one thing if these words were merely prophetic, a foretelling of what was going to take place. Jesus is simply saying, look, I know what's going to happen next. But we need to remember that these words are being spoken in the shadow of the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is the divine son. He is the glorious one. No, he has the power over these events. He has divine power. And so when he says that he is going to be delivered into the hands of men, he is saying that he has decided that he will be delivered into the hands of men. He has chosen to submit himself to their cruelty and abuse. The divine prince of heaven is placing himself into the hands of wicked people. He will allow them to kill him, knowing all the while that he would rise. Jonathan Griffiths and part of our message, The Son of Humble Authority, part of our series in the presence of the King. And while we're going to pause here, we will continue on our next broadcast. So I hope you make it a point to tune in. If you ever miss a program, come and listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is able to be on this station, make the website, the podcast, and all the things that happen behind the scenes happen because of your generous financial support. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book written by Paul Mallard. It's called An Anchor for the Soul. And Jonathan, how would reading this book be helpful in our Christian walk? Well, if we're going to keep walking with the Lord Jesus Christ day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, we need stability. We need stability. And in order to have stability, we need to understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And Psalm 22 is a wonderful Old Testament passage that points us to Jesus and teaches us about his work on the cross for us, entering into the depths of human suffering and bearing the cost of sin in our place at Calvary. I think for each one of us, taking the time to reground and re-anchor our faith in the saving work of Jesus is going to do us tremendous good, and i just love to get this book into your hands. Again, it's called An Anchor for the Soul, written by Paul Mallard, our thank you gift to you for your financial support this month. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or over the phone. Our number is 1-833-99-TRUTH. Again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org, and the phone number is one 1- 833-998-7884. You can also write us at Encounter the Truth, 2176 Prince of Wales Drive, Ottawa, Ontario, 
K2E0A1 or in the U.S. at Encounter the Truth, 215 North Arlington Heights Road, number 102, Arlington Heights, Illinois, 60004. For Jonathan Griffiths and our producer Mark Breda, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.